Yes. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are now at episode nine of Destination Unown Unknown. I am with Sandra L. Hookstra, bookseller from Thomaston, Maine. Um, I spent a lot of time in Maine in my younger years, and I am from New England, so this is going to be almost like a going back home video for me. Um, we are going to interview Sandra and find out all about book selling in Maine and all of the things that she does. So I'm going to have her introduce herself and then we will get into it and she can tell us a little bit about her store. So Sandra, the spotlight is now on you. My name is Sandra and I am a bookseller now in Maine, but I lived in Texas for 32 years and started there. Um, bookselling is not my first profession. I was a registered nurse for years and I also have a degree in business. And uh, at a point in our family's time when there was a move, I decided to leave nursing and enter the antiques world actually. And from the antique world, I found my way into book selling. What I really love about book selling is illustrated books, mostly in the 19th century. How things are printed really excites me. And I am a big fabric collector, a big textile collector, uh, 18th and 19th century textiles. And it was the printing methods of textiles that brought me into the book world. They're the same for textiles as for paper, um, except there's more examples in paper and, and better survivors in paper than there are in textiles. And so in the antique world, before the books entered your life, were you into the textiles then? Yes. So I've, I've always collected. I, I, um, I'm a collector of collections. <laughs> I, we, are, a, we, we know what that means. <laughs> I'm a collector naturally. Yes. Uh, I've always collected. Um, and so I had a big textile collection. My problem as an antique dealer, I started in 2002 um, because of this family change and this family move. Um, and I just kind of dipped my toe into the antique world, selling off things that I had. And I had a hard time parting with the textiles, mm -hmm. but it gave me access to more textiles. So uh, generally antiques was not where I needed to be. <laughs> so, so in 2002, how were you, how were you moving the product back then? So 2002, um, I moved from, from Corpus Christi, Texas to College Station, Texas. Okay. And College Station, as some people may know, is um, Texas A&M University area. Mm -hmm. And my spouse went to uh, work at what now is Baylor Scott and White and um, was at the medical school. And I was very close then to Round Top, Texas, which is a huge antiquing mecca and okay. still is today and has been since the late 1960s. And I had a friend who said, um, what, you, you're leaving nursing, why don't you come in and join me uh, at, at an antique show? And so I did, and until I left Texas, I did shows and internet, but internet didn't start. So, so I did shows several times a year. Um, it, it got ridiculous. I was doing nine to 12 shows a year. Um, <laughs> both with antiques and books. And by 2006, 2007, I had um, pretty much given up the antiques, except for some smalls and um, gone into paper. I did my first um, full book fair in 2007 in Denver at the Rocky Mountain um, Book Fair. Yeah. And it was wonderful immersion in fully into the book world. And then I went back to Texas and yearly I would go back um, until 2013 when I did the Colorado Antiquarian Booksellers, CABS, as it was known at Colorado College. And that was more of an introduction, but, but pretty much that was, I was already doing internet. By then I learned about Chris Lands and that's where I started having a site, um, a platform on Chris Lands, um, but mostly it was in-person show. It was uh, antique shows, a mix of antique shows and um, book shows. And 
in Texas at that time, there was a fabulous show in Houston at the Printing Museum. The Printing Museum burned down in 2019 and never although they have rebuilt a museum in a different place, it's never quite, the show never quite picked up again. Um, there was a show in Austin that was a longstanding show. And there was one in Fort Worth, actually between Fort Worth and Dallas. So between those Texas book shows, Rocky Mountain show, and my little site on the internet, um, that worked pretty well. Somewhere Somewhere in around 2013, 2014, I joined ABE Books okay. and didn't get into Biblio until I changed platforms, internet platforms from Chris Lands to Bibliopolis. Um, and I found that their loading site that they use, Bookhound, was much easier than right. what Chris Lands was using. So is your, is your internet... Um end of the business now is it it's biblio and then your personal site i have my personal site through mm -hmm. bibliopolis I I, use I'll, I'll, link, I'll link that down below for everybody as yeah, well yeah i i use uh and and they were wonderful in building a site that stays up and uh -huh. any questions um they have been wonderful as a platform to use um i sell also on abe books Mm -hmm. on Biblio and on my professional organization, ABAA, the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America's okay. website. And so four, four online platforms. In, in addition to having a brick and mortar store as well. I had a brick and mortar actually. Um, I, and I should have told you this before we started. I had a brick and mortar for five years. What propelled me to Maine is I never meant to go to Texas. <laughs> Although I spent 32 years there, but originally I'm from New Jersey. Yeah. And so I had always wanted to come up this way. It's where I went shopping for books. It's where I went shopping for ephemera, where I went shopping for textiles. And um, an opportunity came up for me to buy a brick and mortar building. And so on the corner of Beechwood and Route 1 in Thomaston, I bought a three-story building built in 1865. What year was this? Uh, this was 2016. Okay. And I owned it for five years and then sold it during the pandemic when mm -hmm. real estate prices went high and I decided it was difficult to run an open shop and do what I love, which was uh, internet and uh, show and also quoting and e-catalogs for institutions. Right. It, it just, it, I had a very difficult time holding on to employees. Um, my best employees were high school students, but of course the problem with them is they graduate. <laughs> so you train and they, them. And they can only work after school and on the weekends. <laughs> yeah, which was fine. I was only open two and three days a week. Okay. Right from the beginning. And I thought that not a big deal. I can handle it. We're also a pass through uh, community for the larger resort areas or the larger tourist areas like Rockland, Maine and Camden, Maine, Belfast. Um, and so I had a lot of people coming in looking for beach reads, paperbacks, and there's nothing wrong with that. I just was not a used bookstore or a new bookstore. And um, it, it just was a lot of confusion. And w were you uh, one of these brick and mortars at that time that was appointment only, or did you have set days a week you were open? I had set days of the week that I was open. When the pandemic started, um, I had by then built a fair number of regular customers who would come. Um, they had summer homes or they were traveling up this way or, and some locals. And as long as they came in with a mask and eye mask, right. they right. could shop and that worked fine. Um, I still have a few regulars who come, um, some institutional librarians will call and say, I'm going to be up that way. Can I stop in? We've talked before. And then that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I now have about 500 square feet on the second floor of, um, my garage. So, yeah. So it's detached from the house and it's a very comfortable, it's 
you know, we're heated and cooled, but um, it, I prefer to work by myself. But, so, but isn't, it, isn't it also nice, because I work from home as well, but isn't it always nice to be able to answer a question and not go more than 20 feet to answer that question from that book? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, what became a problem when I sold the shop, the first floor was books and had a rare book room. The second floor was maps and prints. Okay. And I've had to house most of my maps and prints uh, at a storage unit, a climate controlled storage unit. And I am trying very much to redo my space so that I can get everything here. A lot mm -hmm. of that is not online just because I don't have access to it. Well, you don't need a bedroom. We can make the you can make the bedroom the <laughs> the ephemeral map room. <laughs> well, it would be a great place to put all the maps. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs to sleep anymore? That's right. Do, now, do you do any eBay? Did you ever dabble in eBay or Amazon and any of those I, platforms? I buy on eBay. I did sell on eBay, but it was um, antiques. Okay. <laughs> um, but I buy on eBay from a few dealers who I've gotten to know over the years. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten burned a couple times, like everybody who does an internet site. Um, I am incredibly picky about condition on things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I can't see it well, but I have a handful of dealers that I'll go back to. And, and they are dealers who only sell on eBay. So it's the only way that I've come to know them. Yeah, I think one of the smart moves eBay has made in the past couple of years is going from 12 pictures to 24. Yeah. It, al it allows for a deeper description of photography, you know, and, and so I think when it was 12 pictures, it was kind of hard to get the exact kind of condition notes you wanted on a book. Well, and of course, some people don't take very good pictures. That's true too. They're either blurry or they're not well described and you can't photograph smell. Right. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so and I, unless I think, unless somebody's very honest and says, well, right. it smells a little musty or answers a question. Um and so I've kind of collected people who I okay, I, I've bought this from them and I've bought a couple more things from them. Um and and my interest is 19th century, so primarily, so that it kind of cuts down on the number of repeat sellers, also. Sure. sure. So um, so you so you don't dabble in eBay at all. You just use it as a sourcing tool. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And and even that is, I wouldn't say I'd even I even buy monthly, if I'm <laughs> looking for something or if I'm bored which isn't often, and I'm just, you know, kind of scrolling through and I happen to see something, but not often. Right. So and I, I don't buy from a lot of the other sites either. Um, if I have a colleague who I buy from at a fair, I, I'm, I, I'm very much a hands-on. So if I go to a fair and I see something and that colleague happens to have a site, I'll go back home and I'll make a note that I need to start watching what they've got on their website. And are you still staying busy with in the in the book fair world now? Do you still go often? Um, not often. Okay. I do two big shows a year, Boston and New York, okay. um, both through the ABAA. I keep looking at smaller regional shows, which I'd be very interested in doing, but to get to Boston, it's three and a half hours and anything else is another three, four, five, six hours. And suddenly you're into multiple overnights. You got to get there the night before. You got to set up. You probably have to stay the night after. And then you start adding up hotel stuff. So unless it's a big enough show that right. I know mm -hmm. will work. Uh, in Texas, I was very well placed in College Station where I could get to Houston in 90 minutes. I could get to Round Top in an hour. I could go to Dallas in three, but my daughter lived there, so I could stay with her. Mm -hmm. I could go to Austin in an hour and a half. So it, I was a little more centrally located. Doing shows and coming home at night was a big deal for me. Um, or if I had to stay one night, that you know that was fine. But when we start looking at staying four or five nights on the road, right. it, it's just a whole other, whole other thing. And then you've got to hope that 
whatever you sell um covers not only your meals but your um but your travel and i travel with i have someone i have an associate who works with me and so it's two mouths to feed and hotel rooms and um i probably at this stage of life can't do it by myself unless it's a really small show also the the cost of having tables and a showcase there as well Oh yeah, so then which, you add not the, another the, yeah. That's the biggest five hundred dollars plus electricity. And, yeah, so I love the show world. Um, mm-hmm. I love the antique world. Um, but I'm just as happy going and shopping. Yeah. <laughs> who who isn't? We don't we? Isn't that really? Don't we just sell books so we can go get more books? Isn't it really the well? Unspoken? It's the acquisition. Yeah. yeah. It's really the unspoken truth of what we do. <laughs> we love them so much. This is, we have to sell some. Yeah. So, so besides, um, besides sourcing on eBay, you're, you're, you're in a great historical state. You're also in New England, which is just amazing to source from. How other, what other ways do you source? Are, are you, are you still flea marketing and things of that nature? So probably my primary is other dealers. Dealers who get stuff that this is not what they normally carry and are interested in and dealers who have very large um, stores and there are a lot in New England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, General used bookshops um, where they've got, you know, a small rack of things that they think are interesting set aside. Um, Estate sales. I get calls. Can you come and take a look? um library sales locally um are you still going to, are you still going into people's homes often no I, and i try to avoid it unless i really know that there's something good right. i really dislike disappointing people i'm happy to talk about what they have and certainly you know in almost 20 years i've handled enough stuff that i can talk about what they have but um, I have a hard time disappointing people. And unless I know that, yes, this person has things that I'm going to be interested in, um, if I think it's general used merchandise, you know, general used books, I'll pass it on to one of my colleagues who I know is trying to keep their store full because they're busy. Yeah. Um, or if they have a special interest, as much as I love Americana, I don't sell much Americana unless I just happen to stumble across it. Then I'd rather pass it to one of my colleagues who does Americana. Um, So that and yes, flea markets, because I love flea markets and I'm a collector. Um, Auctions. And as you know, from being in New England, there's a lot of general auctions. In fact, I'm going to one this afternoon and there are auctions at least twice a month. regularly and a lot of them will take pictures of what they have and a lot of times i just go for you know for one item and whether or not i get it but it's I still, enjoy fun. It, so. still fun to go. it is it is trying to carve out time to do the work then of cataloging yeah. online becomes yeah. it, a problem but it's, it's a beautiful thing as you know to work from home but also work never stops, especially in this business. This, this business right. is a 24 hour business. I mean, I, you know, I get questions, in, you know, all day long. Um, so there has to be a certain amount of time I have to dedicate just to sit down and get questions answered. Um, yeah. Is there, is there something that you, you know, that you specialize in now? You said you don't sell a lot of Americana now. Has that market changed for you from the past or is there, is there something specifically you love you love to try to source and and sell now? So my primary interest is illustrated pre nineteen thirty. Pre nineteen thirty, and what and what what happened at nineteen thirty besides the Great Depression that has that changed that for that chrono- so chronology? There's a change of paper and and a change in printing processes. Um, what is interesting is that in the 60s and 70s, some of the more expensive printing processes came back in. Um, but what I really love is wood engraving, okay. woodcuts, chromolithography, 
lithography. Um, and because of that, uh, because of that interest, what I'm really selling is juvenile uh, books, um, travel, because it has maps and, and frequently has a lot of engravings in it. Um, but also, also the ephemera, correct? Also with the ephemera, yeah. It, yeah, that, ephemera. It, it, um, probably right now, mostly stuff that's associated with the state of Maine. Uh, little travel brochures, maps, um, little books written about Maine that were specifically for the tourist trade. Uh, so they've got pictures or they've got little, you know, little engravings in them. Um, and that I like a lot. Uh, I guess the other thing that really interests me uh, is what was traditionally home arts or domestic science. So things like uh, needle arts and cookery, um, gardening, not so much botany or horticulture, but gardening. And there's an awful lot that was printed during the 19th century in that thing. So so mostly I'm selling things that I really like. Does that, does that pre-1930 cooking books have to specifically deal with Maine or could that just be universal? It, yeah, it's it's anything. And, and actually in cookery, uh, because there's a lot of stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, my price points are pretty low. My my biggest thing is I want something clean. I want something tight. I don't want a heavily used binding when uh, people say to me, oh, grandma loved this. It was her favorite book. And, um, you know, it was well-loved. I don't want well-loved books. <laughs> I don't care why they weren't. <laughs> unless, it, unless it's a handwritten cookbook. <laughs> well, that's different. That When we get into manuscript territory, that's yeah. totally different, isn't it? Um, it could so be, the home it arts, could be home arts aren't necessarily heavily illustrated except needle art books, right. um, but um, I like them, so I sell them. Right, and and I'm sure in the in the flea market world still in New England, you can still get those finds quite often. Yeah, that and at auction where they've got a box and perhaps you know, a box lot of there, there's 20 books in a, a box and one really interests me, but it doesn't mean that the others are garbage. It means that the others I can sell at a really reduced price because mm -hmm. I really want that one book and box lots of books still are going very reasonably. Yeah. So, but I, I do know I, I run a uh, Patreon group called paper gold and ongoing book hunters conversation. And so I have well over a hundred booksellers all over the world who uh, tune into that show. Um, and one of the things that they do for, you know, depending on where they live geographically is they'll buy online from auction houses. Um, and, and they've been very successful at buying one box or 10 boxes. Um, yeah. So buying, buying online from auction houses, I've done a few times. I have not been always happy with the result. Again, I, unless you're used to handling books um, and there are a few who handle books very nicely and know what they, you know, what they're selling. But if I can't see it in person, it just makes me uncomfortable. C condition uh, we're talking about. Condition, yeah. And, and they're not usually showing as many pictures as a seller on eBay who who does want to show you you know who is used to handling books and wants to show you a lot of pictures that's interesting yeah yeah i think sometimes when you buy those boxes you're always going to get a certain amount of books that <laughs> don't meet anyone any, any anyone's standards right they're but good for there, recycling but if there's that one in but if there's that one in there that you know you want sometimes you got to you got to pay the piper piper for that yeah yeah, that happens. What type of traffic are you getting nowadays? I mean, you know, you're in your house, you're on, you know, you um you have the store there. Is it is it still walk-in or is it by appointment only for you now? It's appointment only. And and there is nothing about the house, which is on Main Street, so it it's an easy access for people coming up Route One, but there's nothing that would indicate that anything is going, you know, that a business is being conducted there. Right. Um, and since I'm tucked away in the garage, um, you know, it, it's just a very nice, quiet place to work. 
and 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 the people who want appointments uh whether they've seen me before or not um uh, will get appointments right and so. you know I, I i'm guessing that a lot of the networking for you is through the aba and those are the people who may be vacationing or coming through to another place in maine maybe they'll stop by and visit your store yes um membership in professional organizations has always been important to me, even going back to when I was in nursing mm -hmm. um, and business with um, clinic administration. So I belong to the main antiquarian booksellers and um, also the, uh, and I belong to the Texas antiquarian booksellers when I lived in Texas and will rejoin next year because they will have, and they're going to resurrect a show uh in june um but i think professional organizations are important and antiquarian booksellers association of america the abaa has wonderful shows they do a lot of teaching both for the public and for booksellers and um i like i like the association with colleagues uh yeah. being able to um talk to them being able to um network with them i i found is is very enjoyable what, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you this question. I haven't asked this from other ABA members, so I'll ask you. Um, it would be a good question. What What is the process for those that are interested to, to join that type of organization? I, I know it's not a quick fill out a form process. So what is what is the process you had to go through? So there there is it listed online, uh, ABAA.org. And um, if you go to about the ABAA up on the upper um, the upper line, um, it, it lists the criteria and uh, it asks for references. It asks for samples of your work. Um, it asks for a little bit of a bio of who you are and what are you doing. And um, but it is spelled out very nicely there. And worthwhile for anyone who's been in business for, um, you know, at least a year to check out. Uh, they also have a lot of education programs available, um, seminars, both at their fairs and um, some online with something called their Brat Brown Bag Lunches, okay. which we're now doing. Um, and they can be found on YouTube. And uh, everything you can link to through the website. Is, is, is it a lengthy process though to, to join and become a member? I didn't find it to be a lengthy process. No, I mean, there were steps that had to be followed, sure. um, but no, I didn't find it to be a lengthy process at all. Okay. I think yeah. more it's gathering your colleagues who will support you in this because references are required mm -hmm. from, um, ABAA members. I'm gonna I'm gonna link that below too. I'm gonna link that. Right. I haven't done that yet, so I'm gonna link that as well. So what what advice? I have a lot of members in my group who are one to three years into book selling, and and in femra. Uh, what what advice would you give someone who's learning the ropes of sourcing number one, and then on top of that pricing items in a very competitive market because the one thing i started in in the early 90s when there was no amazon or ebay around and suddenly what was rare then is no longer oh, yeah. rare yeah the absolutely copies, the copies are everywhere now yep so the second part of my question is the advice you would give to people who who may have some great harder to find books but those those harder to find books now have competition of we'll just say five to 10 other sellers. Yeah. I think the best advice I can give anybody is to attend tabs, the Colorado Antiquarian Booksellers, which now is no longer in Colorado. It's in Northfield, Minnesota at St. Olaf's College. That's and there are there are scholarships available through the ABAA. There are scholarships available through tabs itself. Um, it is a nonprofit. It has professional booksellers teaching booksellers how to do what they do or how to step up your game. So I had already been selling for six years when I went 
but the knowledge base that was imparted there by professional booksellers who um, just had a deeper understanding was really pretty incredible. It also was another place to network. Mm -hmm. and, and people that I went to cabs with in 2013, I still talk to. Um, it is a week long course. And, um, and I believe that their um, online is cab, C-A-B-S dot O-R-G. We're going to link that too. <laughs> yeah, it's, it really was tremendous. And um, they covered every topic that you could imagine. And, and after the classes, which lasted all day, there was time to sit around with everyone and talk about well, really, how do you do this? And what do you do with this problem? And 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 get a very personalized thing. But we covered things like, you know, where do you go to source? And how do you source? And how do you deal with people? Um, it, it, was, it, it was an enormous crash course. And in that one week, I probably learned more than I had in the six years before. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and you come away with a notebook with resources in it. So that was great. One of my biggest concerns when I went was how do I make a catalog and how do I make an e-catalog and present it to institutions? And I felt like I had a lot of stuff that was interesting, that was um, unique. Some of it was manuscript. And how do I put it in the right hands? I wasn't going to do that by going to shows and, you know, right. small shows yeah. and showing it. Uh, and so you go through things like ha who are institutions and who buys and how do you get into that sort of thing, if that's something that that interests you. But almost any question that I had w was answered. And through that, I then learned about Rare Book School, uh, specifically the one in Virginia at University of Virginia. And then I took a course um, with uh, Dr. Terry Bellinger on... Um, specifically on illustration in the 19th century. And, and that was very, very helpful. And again, University of Virginia has courses where you go. They also have online courses. Most of them are during the summer for their rare book school, but they also have scholarships available. So it's not always a matter of money. It, it's a matter of getting your application in and explaining why you wanna go. Was there anything from back then that was a mind blower for you? Uh, you said you learned so much in that one week that you had in six years previous. Was there one thing that you could share with the audience that? Well, I think for me, it, it was institutional selling, which okay. was something that although I had institutions who would buy off of my Chris Land site, couldn't figure out how they were getting to me. And I couldn't figure out how to break back into um, that world of institutions, you know, and, and who were these people and where did they look? And, and that was something I really, really wanted to do. And um, I don't do print catalogs, um, mostly because of the cost. Right. Uh, I have done a few, but I, it, it's not something I like to do. I like to do short um, e-catalogs and um, and again it was colleagues actually it was Jim Owens who you interviewed I think last yeah. time last episode. who taught me at a show how to do an e-catalog that was very effective and he and I talked about that about two years ago and he said I don't remember doing that I said yeah but you know this is one of the things that this collegial um association it is just so wonderful for yeah jim is a jim is a great guy he's he's uh, uh making, yeah he's making a video now for me he's actually going to be making a clamshell case for excellent. a book and he's going to film it for for the uh for the youtube channel because you know you and i both know that's a lost art um oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know how many people are getting you know younger people are getting into that world and I wanted to make sure that Jim was going to film this because I wanted I wanted to capture that art of of the clamshell case. And so yes. he's, he's going to build one over several episodes for us. 
great. And he just did a presentation on the brown bag lunches through okay. the ABAA on uh, Victorian cloth bindings. So anybody can get that for free if they go to ABAA.org and look for the brown bag lunch series and Jim's talk about um, Victorian binding cloth, which is a whole other, you know, interesting world. Max, I think you're frozen. There you go. You were frozen. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, we both froze on that one. Yeah, I think somehow, some way, Jim has 25 hours in a day, and we all have 24. <laughs> every time, every time I speak with him, there's a there's another project going on somewhere, some way. So it, it, yeah, it's. I, I think the other thing, uh, Max, is with cabs. Is I real? It was the first time I saw the collegial nature of book selling. Uh, up until then, you know, I'd go and set up at an antique show and there was some collegial feeling unless you were selling the same thing as somebody else. And fortunately, at antique shows, I was generally the the book person and there wasn't anybody else. Um, but there was a lot of rivalry. I, I have never felt that at a book fair. Um, it is kind of an all we're all in this and we're all doing something a little bit different and if you're doing the exact same thing as me, great. I'll buy from you and you buy. Right. Because I mean, wow. we all have different customers. Um, but I think the collegial nature of um, the profession is is really, really something. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, be, what you just hit upon, you may stumble upon a collection that is not in your wheelhouse for what you want to do. But you may know someone in, say, Vermont or Massachusetts. Right colleague that you can you can get that uh those books off to and so that that to me with all the interviews I've been doing just the professionalism and the connections of networking that ABA members do with each other is sec is second to none yeah just to none. every time I've interviewed someone from ABAA they're always telling a story about helping out another colleague yeah, and I mean, there's even a um, an online discuss list where people will ask questions. Well, how do I do this? And at no time have I seen anybody shut down and, well, I can't believe you, you know, or why should we give you that information? It, ju it just isn't done. So um, it, tabs was where I learned of this collegial nature. And um, I've been a big, big proponent of, telling people about it and sending people there. Um, it, it's just very important. Right, so let me get to the second part of the question, which is now one source. Now we're pricing, we're doing our research, we're doing our pricing. As we already talked about, it is a much more competitive market online than it's ever been. Uh, how, how, how do you go about pricing something that there may be several other copies in the international market on? Well, I try not to get things. <laughs> yeah, well, we all yeah, we, 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 we all want O O O A K. We all want one of a kind. Uh, but when I do, I will use um, as a quick resource. I'll use Via Libri. Okay. Um, and Via Libri uh, is kind of, you know, I've heard it referred to as the kayak of book pricing. You can't <laughs> buy through Via Libri, uh, but it brings up all the sites that participate and shows everybody who's got that copy. And, and just like uh, when you're shopping for a book, you can narrow um, the search down to the years and the edition and, and you know, does it have a dust jacket? Um, I will often go to um, OCLC, the online computer library um, database to see how rare it is. But if if the market seems to be flooded with it, I I don't try to what people are calling race to the bottom. Well, let me give it the cheapest price to it and it'll sell. I don't think there's much merit in that. Um, I try to evaluate what's out there and, and based on condition, I'll price it where I think it's fair. And if that means middle of the pack, great. And if that means top of the heap, I'll put it at top of the heap. Um, I think condition in your description really is what sets it apart. And, and, you know, once you establish some sort of a relationship with 
even in online um, selling, um, then a buyer knows that they can trust you when they're looking for their next thing. Um, why, why shop the whole stack again? We'll go right to that seller who you know whose description was accurate and and price was fair. Would would you say that the majority of your business is repeat customers? No. No. No, I would say. Um, probably 25% of it is repeat customers, but that 75% is one-time shots or they buy from me once one year and then three years later they buy um, something else. Uh, that's been kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. But there aren't a lot of people collecting juvenile 19th century, early 20th century things. I mean, when I was in the antique world, one of the things that was a big fad, and, and you know that there are fads that come through, not only antiques, but that come through the book world. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Country Living Magazine was a monthly periodical that um, had a lot of style ideas for women. And it, it frequently promoted on a monthly basis different books that you should collect either for yourself or for your children. And, and there was a long time in the early 2000s when the big deal was collecting 1940s, 1950s, 1960s series books for children. Mm -hmm. So all the Cherry Ames and the Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, um, I could barely keep them in stock at a, at a show. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I remember that I remember at one point you couldn't find Tom Swift. Right. And I mean, and so then I developed a lot of people who would come back to me. OK, I've got it. You know, I've got to have the next one. Well, you know, that was kind of a hassle, too, because then I had to go out looking for that next one or find it online when. But but yeah, so there were a lot of people who followed me then or they'd come to every antique show, the the Texas antique shows, the one the Big Red Barn was. um four times a year at that point, spring and fall, summer and winter. Uh, and then they condensed and it, there were a series of shows where certain people would would show up and they'd always be at my booth. Do you have right. whatever? Right. Um, but otherwise, no, n not, you know, maybe 25% of my customers are repeat and, and the rest are one time or just a couple times. And so do you notice any trends now or any of the fads now? For a while, it was for McLaughlin um, publishers. Um, <clears throat> I, I have not seen anything. Um, I have a couple customers who very um, are very much stuck on chapbooks, 19th century chapbooks. I happen to love them, so I carry a lot of them. Um, of course, it's getting harder and harder to find. Are, are, those, mostly, are those mostly poetry? No. Uh, the ones that they are interested in are um, were printed for children. Okay. Um, small engravings in them. Um, a lot of them by um, the American Sunday School Union, uh, the American Bible Society which were, they were moralistic rather than religious. Mm -hmm. And um, they were big on children's literacy. So a lot were printed. Um, no, so they're just small um, books, this big, fit in a child's hand. Um, no hard binding on them. It's a wrapper, string sewn. Um, we, we need those. That's about the only days. thing that I that I look for repeatedly now. I, I don't see anything where people are collecting one author or um, you know one particular thing. For a while it was cookery. Everybody wanted cookbooks. Everybody wanted cocktail books specifically within the cookbooks. And, and I just don't see that right now. Yeah, cook, cookery for me has become a very saturated market. Um, there's yeah. still some great stuff out there, but, the, but I think a lot of... Um, newer sellers they feel like that's something they can dip into because those books are out there right the reason they're out there is because it's such a saturated market right 
needlework books also uh, and manuscript needlework books. For a while, it was very unusual to come across a, ma uh, a manuscript needlework book that perhaps um, a girl had done during high school where she made examples of clothes and different stitching, um, whether it be embroidery or whether it be sewing uh, garments, and they would all be bound into a commonplace book or some sort of little folder. It used to be you couldn't find any, and now suddenly there's a lot, and I think um, at shows, I, I own a couple. I don't even bring them anymore because they're just out there. You know, they came out of people's closets and grandmas and great grandmas died and people are realizing that there's value to them. I, I, I'm sure somebody sees a trend in something. I don't see one right now. Yeah, I, from my end of it and, and how I sell books, I, I still think people are collecting and the younger generation is collecting vintage science fiction still. Um, so I will tell you that at the New York show in April, uh, the New York ABAA show at the Armory, um, it was an amazing number of young people. And when I say young people, under 30, under 25, um, it was very exciting. Um, the people across from me uh, do science fiction, fabulous science fiction, and they they had a lot of people to talk to you could tell collectors who didn't quite know you know what was going on with it but their science fiction um display was fabulous very graphic um wonderful dust jackets on on those books mm -hmm. um but the show itself was very exciting um lots and lots of young people you're not the first, you're not the first bookseller to tell me that. Um, the other ones I spoke to ha who have been who were there were so excited. This is oh. like this is almost like the first time they've seen an uprising of a younger generation yeah. with an interest in the ephemera and the vintage and the antique books and literature that they'd never seen before. So maybe as we talk about trends, this is a trend. Maybe yeah. maybe something is happening to the audience that was raised by cell phones and the internet, now they're trying to find the prehistory of that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. My children are in their 40s and they have very little interest in collecting. So this is, you know, almost two generations down from them, uh, or, or at least a half generation down from them, that suddenly is very excited. Um, I think it's my, great, my great children got us. enough. I'm sorry. Great for all of us. It's, oh, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. And, um, you know, not only as a seller, but it means that things will be saved and preserved because I think there was enough interest in the physical. Right. And, and the fact that that younger generation will probably now start looking at what their grandparents were saving is going to be vital to save some of this stuff that right. I was a little unhopeful for <laughs> a couple years ago. Right. It seems like something changed during the pandemic. I mean, a lot of bad things happened during the pandemic and I did not expect the book world to bounce back as, as much as it has, but I think that the excitement is there. Well, uh, I, can, I can tell you this, I, I was a high school teacher during the pandemic selling books on the side and it was the pandemic that got me to retire from teaching because my book my book business it was doing going very well but it suddenly exploded yeah and i retired from teaching and then just jumped into this full time and yeah there's definitely more and more people buying books than i've ever seen before and um with all of the platforms out there to sell it, it's been an amazing ride and I, I don't see it slowing down. The world is a very large place. Yeah. And, and I think when you think about the talk that was going on before the pandemic, which was print literature is doomed and all, all these e-readers are going to put us all out of business. And there was a lot of doom and gloom going on unless you had already a niche carved out for yourself. Well, yeah. Uh, 
but things have really changed. And, and I don't see young people just interested in one genre. I, I brought miniatures to the fair and um, I talked all day long till I was blue uh, about the miniatures. Uh, and they ne they'd never seen that before. They'd never seen them, no. So it was it was interesting. And, and it was a lot of fun, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Um, I sold a few of the miniatures. I had a lot of other stuff and, and, and I really enjoy that there, but, um, it, it was a lot of fun talking to people who hadn't looked at things right. at, at something for the first time and talking to them about, you know, how they were printed and how they were bound and, and why did they even do something like that? So yeah. that was cool. Very cool. I have, I have just about two more questions for you. Then, sure. we'll, then we'll let you get back. Is there a story that you could share about an unbelievable find and an unbelievable sell? So years ago, when I was traveling up here before I had moved here, I um, went to one of these little group shops and was just kind of hustling through. And there was, uh, was on the second floor and there was a, uh, a bunch of ephemera and a little book in it. And it was, um, I thought at first, do you remember in the 1970s, there was a lot of reprint of um, early books and it would be done by an institution or a museum. Uh, Mystic Seaport reprinted mm -hmm. a lot of things for tourists, you know, just for the tourist trade and they get it just right and even tried to get the paper right. And also, bought, Dover was big in the 70s. I remember my house. Usually, right. And usually on the back, it would say, you know, reprinted Yes. a little thing. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a mother goose. And um, if I remember correctly, and I may not, I believe that it was an 1833 mother goose printed in, in Boston. And I picked it up and I thought the front cover had um, the bottom corner missing. Otherwise, everything was there, and I thought, "Oh, this is um, this is a great a great thing to have just to refer back to." Because I was convinced from the feel of the paper that it was uh, a a nineteen seventies reproduction. Well, it wasn't, so I paid fourteen dollars for it, and then I sold it for thirty five hundred. That was fun. And if, you know, if memory serves me correct, and maybe it does, and I hope it still does, I believe Mother Goose is buried in uh in Boston. In Common, right? Am right. I right on that? I remember right. that at at the church there, but of course that you know, mother mother goose probably predates that. Of course, but, of course. But yes, yes, she has a tombstone there. I re I, re I remember that from my time there. That's, that's yes. yeah, that's a great story and a great find. It's worth going to see and have your picture taken by Mother Goose's grave. You're making me miss New England just talking to you, <laughs> making me miss it. Um, all right. So my last question, I hope you're prepared for it. The show is called Destination Unknown. I never know where the person I'm interviewing is going to send me next. So please tell me, where am I heading to? <laughs> you're going to Belfast. Belfast, but Maine. Right? Belfast, Maine. And you're going to talk to somebody named Craig Olson, who has an in, a much more interesting backstory than I do, and is not originally a Mainer, and he lives on an island. Okay. So um, you're going to see Craig in Belfast. So he so because he lives on an island, for him to get back to the mainland, he has to take, take a, a ferry twice. Ferry, ferry okay. twice a day. Twice a day. Ferry twice a day. But from. he has a wonderful, wonderful shop. It's not his first shop, mm -hmm. um, but I'll let him tell you about it. But if anybody is up on Route 1 going through Belfast, Maine, on their way to Canada or up to MDI, it absolutely is a place to stop. And he's a nice guy. The Got shop it. is gorgeous inside. All the original, I believe it was a jewelry store. Mm -hmm. So all the original cabinetry is still in there and it, it's really lovely that's amazing well i thank you for allowing me to take up this hour with thank you thank you max today. it has been a great pleasure uh the show will air next tuesday on youtube so please 
go in and there's going to be questions for you, but I will okay. definitely stay in touch. And I, and I want to thank you for all of the great information and knowledge and your journey. Thank you very much, Max. It's been fun. Yep. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.